right, folks. Let's get started. Um, I'm John Horgan. I'm director of the Center for Science Writings. I just have a couple of announcements. First, uh, turn off your cell phones, please. I'll turn mine off. And uh, second, um, there is an E101 sign-up sheet over here, but that is only for people who still need credit for the E101. And apparently that's a very small number of people. All right, but if that's you, that's um, over here. So um, I just want to say very briefly, this event is co-sponsored by the Center for Science Writings and by the Stevens uh, Green Team. And um, David D'Agostino, who's a leader of the Green Team, was really a uh, force behind organizing this event. And um, I'm delighted that it's a joint event, and I'm also really thrilled that our featured speaker is Andy Repkin, who is an old friend, a former neighbor, and one of the most important journalists um, in the world, really. Uh, so, uh, so I hope you're all as excited as I am. Um, anyway, David will give Andy the uh, introduction he deserves now. So. Thank you all for coming. And uh, I just also want to mention that there are uh, late refreshments uh, over at that table. Um, so please feel welcome. All right. So Andrew Repkin graduated from Brown University in 1978 with a degree in biology, later from Columbia University with a master's in journalism. Our guest has over 30 years of experience reporting on science and the global environment and newspapers, magazines, books, documentaries, and his New York Times blog, Dot Earth. On the screen, covering stories from Hurricane Katrina to the troubled relationship of climate science and politics. He has served as a staff reporter at the New York Times from 1995 to 2009, and in 2003 became the first reporter at the Times to cover stories from the North Pole. In 2008, Mr. Refkin received the John Chancellor Award, one of journalism's highest honors, for his two decades of pioneering coverage of climate change. His work has won most of the top honors in science journalism including the National Academy of Sciences Communication Award and two awards from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. His first magazine feature on a worldwide death, death toll from misuse of the herbicide Paraplot won an, an Investigative Reporters and Editors Award. He has been honored in academia for a sustained focus on climate and energy, receiving a, an honorary doctorate in 2007 from Pace University, University excuse me, a Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award from Tufts in 2008, and the 2007 Sol Feinstein Environmental Award from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Since 2010, he has been the Senior Fellow for Environmental Understanding at Pace University, where he teaches courses on blogging, environmental science communication, and documentary video with a focus on sustainable development. He has written acclaimed books on global warming, the changing Arctic, and the fight to save the Amazon rainforest. Two films have been produced based on his writings. In 1994, The Burning Season, and Rockstar, 2001. <laughs> Quite a <account. laughs> Our guest is also a performing songwriter and multi-instrumentalist. Since 1991, Mr. Repkin has performed with the likes of the Grammy Award-winning folk legend, the late Pete Seeger, and from 2003 to 2011, was part of Uncle Lee, the Blues Roots Band. In 2013, Mr. Repkin released his first album entitled A Very Fine Line, which can be found on bandcamp.com. <laughs> By the way, it's very good. I recommend you guys check it out. <laughs> um, I could go on about our guest achievements, but the list is very long. He is a man of many hats, and I know we would all rather hear him talk than I. So, uh, Engineers for a Sustainable World Stevens Chapter is very proud to have such an esteemed speaker open our this semester's sustainability lecture series, which again is co-sponsored by the Senate, the Center for Science Writings, and the Stevens Green. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming back to Stevens, Mr. Andrew Rifkin. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, yeah, the album is available anywhere in music is available. Uh, and I might even, well, I've got my guitar here. Um, I'm going to try to really combine two thoughts, one of which is I haven't really articulated in a lecture before, and the other is uh, this concept of noosphere that I've been focused on, which is the power of our connectedness, not just the internet, but just the ways we 
on this planet are becoming uh, uh, single-minded in a way, even as we're multifaceted in our intelligence and our views. And what that, I think that holds great prospects for uh, good things for, for a century that, even with trajectories that look very uh, troubling, whether you look at climate change, loss of biodiversity, it's, it's easy to kind of fall into what was me mode, which is the, the environmental message that I grew up with in the sort of mid to late 20th century, um, the 1970s when I was a kid. Uh, we all, and then we had the Cold War on top of that. So we had uh, things like Silent Spring, we had uh, the specter of nuclear apocalypse. And so we, we grew up, not surprisingly, with a pretty dire view of things. Um, and I've changed in many ways. I still see things as really troubling. But I see a, a great prospect, again, for um, a relatively smooth uh, trajectory for our ridiculously innovative and uh, surprising species in this century. And I couldn't be wrong, believe me. And I think we have to get comfortable with the reality that we, we don't really know the path forward, that, that we can be wrong about things uh, on both ends of the spectrum. So I'm just going to quickly kind of engage a little bit on that idea of uh, what was me and, and the, other, the other key message of the environmental movement in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even today, is shame on you. It's uh, Exxon's fault or it was George Bush's fault. Whatever the problem is, it's someone else's fault. It's a big company that is drilling something rapaciously and wastefully and, and destructively. And, and it kind of lets us off the hook when we do that. I don't know if anyone here saw recently the, uh, this uh, assertion. There was a paper that said 90 companies are responsible for global warming. You probably saw some of those headlines. And immediately when I saw it, you know, I've written about some of those companies, and they've done bad things, some of them. Uh, but they've also provided us with the fossil fuels that we've based all the modern, all of, everything we do is, is fossil, is fossil driven still, primarily. Um, even with blazing growth of renewables, even with nuclear power, uh, you're providing you know, roughly 20% of our electricity. Uh, we, we basically are fossil organisms. My house in the Hudson Valley is heated with oil. And uh, I would love to you know, put in a geothermal system, but if you look at the tens of thousands of dollars that would cost, and I'm not a wealthy guy, you realize that the, the alternatives to the, our fossil fuels are just too limited. So is it 90 companies that cause global warming, or is it human, human um, uh, thirst for energy, knowing that energy is one of the great sources of everything we cherish, including democracy? Daniel Bot, the Daniel Botkin, an ecologist who wrote a really good book about Thoreau a long time ago, and has written a number of books since then, including the Renegade, Renegade Naturalist. He, um, he looked back in time, he says that the flowerings of democracy in the world have all happened with abundant energy. Now one of them, back in the sort of Greco-Roman time, the, the source of energy was slaves. So that says, you know, like fossil fuels, slaves, sorry, I should make sure that doesn't go to sleep. Hold on, don't wake up yet. I'll periodically tap it. Um, Anyway, energy doesn't always come from good things, but energy is necessary for, again, for civilizations to thrive, even and today more so than ever. Look at everything we're doing right now. It's in a climate control room. Uh, I got here in a car, it was a Prius, so it's like a half good car, <laughs> half the time, <laughs> half the time. And the electricity that's running that Prius is still primarily fossil or, or nuclear, uh, not, not renewable. So, you know, we're making, the compromises we have with things like energy all the time. Yeah. So, um, so what was me and shame on you? Don't go very far anymore. Now, and I grew up, when I was 14, I remember I lived in Rhode Island, and uh, on sort of a suburban area that was rapidly growing, and there was this little, if I walked through a little tract of woods and fields behind my house, I could get to the Hunt River, and I'd go fishing. And I loved doing that. And one day I was doing that, and there was a bulldozer there near one of my favorite trees. And they were obviously, they were getting ready to clear an area for yet another suburban tract like the one that I was already living on. And I wrote, and I was so pissed off, and so, I had shame on you coming out of all my pores. And I wrote a little, it was actually like a, a death threat, actually. You know, a 14 year old death threat. It was like, if you destroy these trees, you know, death will stalk you. I don't know what I wrote, but it was something horrible. I think I wrote it in red ink, and I put it on the seat of the, the bulldozer. You know, so I, I grew up with that kind of feeling of that industry and development is, is bad. But then, you know, as you get older, and now I'm in my mid 50s, late 50s. And uh, you start to reflect a little bit more on the realities of life, and you, you reflect a little bit more on your own trajectory and your own sense of, as a grown-up versus as an 18, 14-year-old, you, you sort of take some ownership for some of the, the realities around you. So I've kind of moved away. I'm trying to move away from reflexively saying, woe is me and shame on you. That's what I'm trying to get at. And as a journalist, 
for now 31 years writing about science and the environment, which is a very scary thought. I, um, as I grew in that field, and I came to it with a biology degree, I didn't like grow up wanting to be a reporter, but I became a reporter because it's so wonderful to look around the world and, and learn constantly. Every day to be learning is your job. It's just an incredible thing to do. But um, the norms of journalism are to, well, of course, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. So we like bad stuff. And uh, there's this compression that happens. Um, in the newsroom of the New York Times, the, the, the key question was always, like in mid-afternoon, there'd be some paper coming out in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and you would think as a science writer, this is really a significant advance of what we know about glaciers. And then you had to pitch it to an editor, and, and she, at the time, Cornelia Dean, would say, well, where's the front page thought? That's, that's like a newsroom saying, What's, where's the front page thought in that? So, and, and you're always thinking, well, so you have this instinct to want to sort of find the dramatic angle. And, and the nuance gets kind of shaved away. And then as I learned more about the science process, I realized that at every step of the way of the production of knowledge, we have a torquing toward the front page thought. The first is that scientists don't work on well-established ideas. They work on the frontier of knowledge. And every paper is, uh, you know, the papers that are impactful are the ones that are about some new thing. And when you're new, you're, that means it's edgy, and that means there's probably substantial uncertainty. And, and then, the, the, that's the scientist doing the work. And then there's the NSF, or whoever provided the grant. They want to justify their spending, so they'll say, they'll write a press release that might sort of torque away a little bit, shave away a little bit of the edges of, you know, how, how, how new and novel and uncertain that knowledge might be. And then, and then you, the reporter, are doing the same thing. So by the time it gets to the public, you have this kind of shaved away caricature of the new idea. And quite often, after six months or a year go by, you'll get these rebuttal papers that'll come in. And, and in the literature, you'll see that, that front page article get shaved away to be very nuanced or, or even meaningless. I'll give you one quick example of how this works out. Two or three years ago, there was a big paper in Nature by a team of Dalhousie in Nova Scotia on plankton trends in global oceans, uh, and they found a relationship. They, they said they found a relationship to global warming. So climate change was going up, and plankton, uh, phytoplankton in the oceans was declining. And, and they had this big, splashy paper, big press release, a lot of front page stories. And uh, there was a scientist, an ocean scientist at Rutgers, who you probably know, um, who was warning me he had seen this work in progress, and he was saying, you know, there's some issues with this. And, and I, when I wrote about it um, on Dot Earth, I, I included a lot of caveats that were kind of not there in a lot of the other coverage. So it's what a classic woe is me thing. Uh, you know, we thought global warming is bad enough. Now it's going to depopulate the oceans of plankton, which are helping to suck in the CO2 that's going to help limit global warming. Uh, so it was a big, noisy kind of thing. And, and then there were three rebuttal papers that came out six months later in the same journal. And now it's kind of way back in the murk of nuance, maybe kind of stuff. And so, so I became attuned to those realities as a journalist, and, and that gets you, it either makes you sort of humble and just more careful yourself, or realize that there's aspects to your field that are not helping, not helping public discourse. Uh, so how can you do that better? How can you kind of communicate something like that in a way that will still get attention, and, uh, it, but also be real, you know, be accurate about both what we know and don't know? And that's a really hard question to answer. And then, uh, so I spent my first 20 years writing about global warming. The first story I did on global warming was in 1988. It was a long piece in the uh, cover of Discover magazine. Uh, and um, so I've been writing about this for a long time. And from then through about 2005, so from 88 to 2005, most of my stories on global warming, nearly all of them, were about uh, the biogeophysical phenomena. You know, greenhouse gases coming out, uh, that has all kinds of implications for everything from the Arctic to uh, the tropics. And you know, writing about all these different facets of that over and over and over again. It was around 2005, I, I started exploring the social science, the behavioral science. You know, after all this time writing about it, you know, as a journalist, you think you write all these stories, well, people will read them and they'll kind of go, oh, okay, we need to do this. And then when you get dig in on the social science and you realize, oh my God, why didn't I read this 20 years ago? <laughs> Because these are the scientists who study how we respond to or reject uh, information based on preconceptions, based on all kinds of issues. Some of them going right back to our evolutionary uh, reflexes, you know, fight or flight and stuff. We're not good at long-term problems. We're not good at long-term risks. As you know from 
the surge from Sandy, which I can't remember how much of your campus flooded. <laughs> it was bad. Yeah, so, you know, and scientists have known this. There was a great hurricane in 1823, I think it was 1820, 1821 or 1823? 21. 21, that, that turned Manhattan briefly into two islands. The, the, that low section in the middle, like Chelsea or whatever, kind of got washed through. And of course, Manhattan was a lot less uh, built up at that time. So, so, and then you know sea level rise, and, and you, you know that we've, we've missed, our, we haven't had a big hit here in, in, in generations, literally. So, so, so we're bad at long-term risk, you know, planning ahead for an inevitable uh, hard knock, even as long as it's sort of uh, it's on the next mayor's political cycle, we don't think about it. So, so the more I dig in, dug in on that work, the more I realized, oh my God, uh, if I just keep doing the, the, what I've been doing for the last 20 years, for another 20, and this is what you, happens when you're in your 50s. You start to reflect on, on the time you have left. I, I, I kind of thought, that's really, I don't want to do that. And so that, that was one thing that led me out of journalism and into academia, where I came to, I thought, now I'll be more effective. I'll become a professor. <laughs> <laughs> Notice where the laughter is turning from. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I do, and the, the job title I have a case that I created when I left the Times is Senior Fellow for Environmental Understanding. Because I, it's not just about environmental journalism or communication. It's about trying to understand the whole, from the phenomenon to the observation of the phenomenon to the medium, media, to the, the person sitting there reading on his or her device or whatever, to, uh, to then the social discussion the debate about policy, what can you torque, what knobs can you torque to have better outcomes? And um, in the work I've been doing since I came to Pace four years, four years ago this month, I believe that, and, uh, and also just in my reporting and stories that I've written, one of which had the title, An Inconvenient Mind, meaning uh, this part of the climate problem, I, I've become cognizant of both opportunities and deep problems that come when you look at that aspect of these issues. And it's the same thing whether it's a, it's a slow decline in biodiversity. Um, I'll give you one example from that arena. You know, the oceans today have about 80% fewer, 80% uh, less biomass of the great fishes, the tunas, the sharks, than they did 50 years ago. But you can still go and buy tuna and can for, for a very reasonable price. Uh, bluefin tuna are in serious trouble because they're such a prized species for sushi. But, and you look at, it, you can go down to the docks, you can go to Montauk, and I can still buy, you know, I can go out with Carl Safina, my, my friend, who's a great marine scientist and conservationist and, and a fisherman, and, and catch 40 pound stripers uh, routinely. Amazing, you know, so the bounty still feels there, but we've lost something huge, and, and that's what's called, that's the social problem of the shifting baselines of perception, that you could, every, most of the young people in this audience, you've grown up, with the norm that the Arctic is, uh, sea ice is in retreat, polar bears are in trouble. Uh, for those of us who grew up mainly in the 20th century, uh, the Arctic was a forbidding, frozen place that uh, now we see in transition, sharply changed from the conditions that we grew up reading. Uh, my dad's book had this books on Admiral Furies, you know, trying to get to the North Pole in the race with the other guys. And, and so, but for you, it's like the Arctic is in, is in trouble. It's, and or if you're into shipping, the Arctic is a great new opportunity place for um, taking a big shortcut across the top of the world. And, and, but what I wanted to stress too is that all of that, when you get that, when you understand those issues, you can see what look like really bad problems. We're not gonna get the carbon problem right. The idea that we're gonna pass some kind of either a global treaty or a national bill that's kind of a comprehensive top-down sh shrinking uh, ceiling uh, for CO2 is not going to happen because of what I said at the very beginning about our, our thirst for energy dominates our understanding of long-term risks. But the same body of work reveals that even though society is deeply divided about this issue called global warming, that there's a large group, except for one little shade of end of the curve called dismissive Americans. This is work from Yale, the Yale Climate Change, Yale Climate Communication Project. There's only a tiny chunk of us who reject the whole thing and reject the idea that uh, there's things to do about energy that are smart. So when you look at the stuff that we agree on, uh, there, there's, there's across the board agreement that uh, energy efficiency matters, that um, 
innovation in energy matters, support for, for research and, and getting new, new energy norms, um, that even paying a premium for renewable energy technologies, like, a, like a, having a mandate for uh, more efficient cars, even if, even if you, the survey person, knows it's going to be more expensive, virtually everyone in this country is enthusiastic about that, and except for one little group. Of course, one little group can have an outsized influence in our politics, and that's, that's a political issue. It's not an environmental issue. Figuring that out is something we, as a society, have to grapple with. Um, it's, but, but saying that it's an environmental problem is not the way forward. We need to realize that the outsized power of a tiny group is, is the issue, uh, because it's an issue for many other things as well. So I, um, I want to shift gears into another aspect of things here. And I, again, this is kind of a new talk, so I'm actually referring to some paper. Oh, I did want to show you, you know, I've done my share of shame on you, journalism. The, the article that you heard about, my first uh, cover, it wasn't a cover story, 1983, look at this vintage thing. This is my story on Paraquat, the, this herbicide that in 1983 was killing a lot of people. So I, I've done plenty of shame on you kind of reporting, but I, again, this I, it doesn't end up solving the climate problem. The climate problem is different than this problem, and different than most of the environmental problems of the uh, late 20th century that were tractable. Even uh, sulfur, even the Clean Air Act, getting conventional pollutants, reducing those is not like getting at CO2. So going forward, why am I optimistic? Well, partially, it's, you know, we are all different. We all, as I said, approach information differently. I uh, am a middle child, so I do tend to approach these debates with a sense of listening to everybody in the room, and, the, and that, which was my role in our household. How many middle, any other middle child? Uh, look, look, look. Do you feel that way, or is this like a fifth? I don't know. Um, so my blog, even the cover of my album, which is this person on a tightrope. Uh, this is uh, from it was an illustration from 1547 of a tightrope walker. Um, the the, the, um, the uh, emblem on this thing, the, the original lithograph, says um, basically the middle is the wise place to be. And that's not always true, but, but it's mostly true. So um, assessing the landscape from here and looking at the new tools that we have like the internet, I think I have great optimism, basically. And I think that I'm going to sort of lead you through a few reasons why I'm optimistic. One is that information matters, for sure. I've seen it matter. Getting the right ideas in the right place at the right time makes a difference. And we've never had a better medium for doing that. In the old days, if you wanted to get the right ideas in the right place at the right time, it had to go on a ship or, or through some circuitous means to get to that place. And now it's a, a, global, a global instantaneous soup of ideas. And you can look at that and you say, oh yeah, but, but what about all the noise? And this is where I want to actually pull up a PowerPoint. So excuse this for a second. And there is a lot of noise. Like on climate. This is, um, you know, basically, given what we know about human nature, what I said, that we all have our predispositions, and the internet, you, 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 you can listen to what I just said about the power of the internet to do good things, and you say, well, yeah, but that, the internet just allows you to pick and choose the information you want. If you're worried about climate change, you'll migrate to, um, well, Jeff Masters, or um, Climate Progress, for sure, if you're a real hardcore, you know, liberal sort of legislation as a solution. Realclimate.org is a really great source of basic information on science, so you can reinforce your argument if you're a denialist, as you saw, in the, the, there's a whole argument about the merits of using that phrase. But if you are someone who just wants to reject the whole idea, you go to Climate Depot, and uh, what's up with that? So, so how does that solve the climate problem? Well, it, it, that definitely doesn't. And even, here's what makes it even worse. All of that, that whole big argument we're all having about climate, is happening amid this argument, which is just sort of like, this is just everything. All the different, this is newsmap.jp. Go to that website sometime, and it gives you a real-time view of what we're all tracking in the world, whether it's the Olympics results or, or earthquake or whatever. Um, and this, I just took that whole, that, this whole argument that we get so fixated on, 
is happening. I just stuck it in here, like in this space, in this whole field. And this is too big. When you actually look at the, da the data from what we, how much news hours or news inches, it's like way smaller than that. So, so, so here you're saying, well, wait a minute, Andy. You said this is going to solve the, the world's problem. And then you have this kind of issue. You have amplification and distortion. This was, a, I, I gave a talk a few years ago, in 2009, on population growth in relation to climate change and, and the idea of, in America, maybe one of the, I said it's sort of a thought experiment. Maybe if, if you really were worried about global warming, maybe the best thing you could do is have fewer kids because that would lower your carbon footprint. And this uh, conservative blog picked up on that, and then uh, Rush Limbaugh picked up on that and uh, said this. This guy from the New York Times, if he really thinks that humanity is destroying the planet, humanity is destroying the climate, that human beings in their natural existence are going to cause the extinction of life on Earth, Andrew Revkin. Mr. Revkin, why don't you just go kill yourself <laughs> and, and help the planet by dying? <laughs> so there's a nice bit of civil discord. <laughs> Unbelievable. So, so I must be crazy. Um, but I, I don't think I am. And it's because of what I've been calling noosphere. Other people have different words for it. Um, and it's actually not a new word. Believe me, I don't want to voice a new word on the world. There's way too many new words coming out. It's a, it's a respelling of an old word. But I, found, I kind of started to stumble on this the reality of what we're building um, in 2009. I was in Istanbul reporting, when I was still on the staff, the paper uh, reporting an article on the earthquake risk to that big city. It's not a risk, it's an inevitability. They've had 10 great earthquakes in like the last 1,500 years. Not clock, not clockwork enough that you can predict within decades when the next one will be, but the next one is coming. It could be tonight, it could be 30 years from now. It will almost surely be in this century. And so I was doing a piece on, uh, there were, um, reinforcing schools, this is a you know a little duck and cover exercise like the ones we did for the Cold War, but with much more reality. And while I was there, you know, when, you, when you're a reporter, you go to an unusual place, uh, you're like a kid magnet, so all these kids come running up to you, and, and they're usually saying things like, uh, Medicaid or whatever, and these kids were saying, Facebook? <laughs> and I thought that was interesting, because they were in a poor neighborhood. This was a poor part of Istanbul, these kids don't have computers. But they had a, com uh, a, community, a community center nearby that did have computers. And they were all living on Facebook and playing all the games that my son in, back in the Hudson Valley was playing. And actually, I ended up friend friends. These are some of my Facebook friends from that part of Istanbul. And which is kind of, and it said to me, now I'm thinking about this, you know, they're playing Farmville. My son did, was not playing Farmville, but he's playing like other games, Minecraft. I'm sure some, someone in this room is into Minecraft or is related. You can smile, you can admit it. It's really cool, it's an unbelievable game. There's actually a teacher in New York City who's developed Minecraft EDU. It's a, a new company where they're building learning environments in Minecraft. Anyway, so I, I start, start, start to realize these kids in a few years, because of the improvements in translation interfaces, are gonna be playing, whether you're in Turkey or in Brazil or in, in the Hudson Valley, you'll be playing together and communicating together through these um, media, that these, these pathways we're building. And you know, kind of compare that to this was my way of communicating with kids on the other side of the world. Pen pals, and again, I'm sure the, the great beards here like me um, know about this. It, it would take two weeks. You'd send a letter to West Cameroon. That was my pen pal, and he would send a letter back. And you'd and I and I here I am. You know, that was when I was 12, and I still remember West Cameroon because of that that experience. So now there's just so much more possibility of that happening. Now, of course, not every kid is doing this. So this gets to the opportunities that, are, that surround us, that we are flooded with, to use these tools in creative new ways to, to maximize that kind of crosstalk. So if you're end up a teacher, you want to design a curriculum uh, element about uh, earthquake safety, and you're in Los Angeles, you can co-learn with kids in Istanbul. It's that kind of thinking that's, all it is, is that the only thing that's missing is, is awareness of the possibilities. And so that's what I try to teach it, the pace and elsewhere. And now some people have already drunk the Kool-Aid. Like, so here's Scott Delisi, he's the US ambassador to Nepal. And I, you know, 10 years ago, the role of the US ambassador to Nepal would be to put on a gray suit and go to all these functions and have, hobnob and have 
whatever the, the poly local liquor is, with the prime minister and all that stuff. And now he's, his main, one of his main interfaces with the poly citizens, citizens is Facebook and Twitter. He's, he's, he is like the archetype. Giving you another example of what's possible, speaking of Facebook, there's a, uh, an art student, uh, Isaac Frescia, was a, a Halifax high school art student, out of college, I think. And he created what looks like a um, Facebook conversation. And, but when you look a little closer, you realize there's something funny going on. So Tiger posts, totally screwed, like 3,200 of me left. Sad face. And then Panda says, Panda likes this. But Panda says, I don't mean like, like, good. I mean, like, like, I feel you, bro. I'm around 2,500 now. And then the Marine Turtle, oh no, really? I'm sorry to hear that sad face. Chin up, though, things can still turn around. Rhino, doubtful. <laughs> you know, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant piece of comic art. And this went flying around to Facebook, hundreds of thousands of views and likes. And it was all designed, of course, to keep, to bring people's attention to the plight of endangered mammals, mostly mammals, reptiles too. And it was uh, connected with World Wildlife Fund. And, and I was a student, you know, I have this young person with a creative way of communicating, went, got, got an idea to hundreds of thousands of people that might have gone through a newspaper or a TV program at one point, but now anyone can do it. So it's a matter of skills and motivation, and you can do some amazing things now. And this all, this idea of new it, noosphere was newosphere in the 1940s. Um, uh, uh, there's a piece on uh, NPR, I was in this long, hour long uh, sec segment on this guy, Teilhard de Chardin, French theologian, but he was also an archaeologist, amazing man, and Vladimir Vernotsky, a Russian uh, geochemist in the 1930s, 40s. They both were kind of closing in on this idea that we're building a planet of the mind, a, a, a newosphere, a uh, kind of a layer, a sheath around the world that they saw as a force for good. And, and so when I say noosphere, I'm just sort of building that idea. But then I, I kind of dug in on this question when I started learning more about it. And, and I realized that Darwin, way back in 1871, in The Descent of Man, he wrote this really powerful chunk of that less famous book of his. As we advance in civilization, small tribes are united in the larger communities. The simplest reason will tell you each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to all members of the same nation, this point being reached, there is only an artificial barrier to prevent his sympathies extending to the men of all nations and races. So the artificial barrier is being breached. We breached it a while ago with telegraphy and telephones, and now we're breaching it in a massive way with computing power and, and uh, fiber optics. And, and this is all the way from, like, in, in 2010, I think it was the World Cup was in South Africa, they um, laid, um, some entrepreneurs laid some extra fiber from South Africa to the Mediterranean ahead of the games to make sure they had bandwidth to, to do all that HD uh, imagery for the World Cup. And then once the World Cup is over, now all that bandwidth is being harnessed by all the countries along East Africa, except Somalia, of course, which is a basket case. But they're all tying in. It's lowering the cost of, of uh, internet access across uh, that part of the continent. Amazing things underway. And by the way, that was a privately financed fiber optic cable. So noosphere is basically uh, this. You know, Stevens is part of it. It's a network of schools, libraries, businesses, dot orgs. Whoever has the skills and motivation to try to make the world a better place can do so now in a faster way than ever before. And it's not just about digital stuff because you need to have the physical stuff as well. You need to be convening in campuses and then having relationships with other institutions on the ground in places like whether it's in Beijing or Botswana. It's all doable, and I'm sure there, some of this is being done here now. I'm gonna give you a couple more quick examples. By the way, you'll notice that many of my examples are not journalism, which is another reason. Journalism's great, it's still vital. There are bad actors to point out, there, there are things to explain, but, but there's so many other ways. J journalism is a shrinking wedge of a growing pie of ways to communicate, so that's another reason I love full-time journalism. So anyway, a few years ago, some British uh, graduates, I think they were graduate students, they did a project where they went around the shores of the Atlantic Ocean and did these little exercises on sea level rise, where they went, they took uh, recruited students from local schools, went down coastal communities, go down to the shore, and basically they're studying, you know, what is three feet of sea level, what is a meter, 
of sea level rise mean in our community? And that alone would be a really interesting thing. They went to Ghana and, and, and uh, Nantucket and um, Scotland and many other places. But then they didn't leave it at that. Using the web and Skype, they, they got a lot of these schools talking to each other. So there's a network learning going on, which I think is a great, again, think about, think about the uh, pen pal letters and then think about the idea of having coastal communities who are all facing the same issue, rising seas, rising storm surge risk, and uh, kind of learning about it in ensemble. It's a, it's a very powerful way to share and shape ideas. And I've seen this happen. I, I was at the UN a few years ago for a World um, Environment Day, and they had five or six schools from around the world there. And these, these girls in the school in Islamabad were asking the kids in the school, uh, high school in um, Queens via teleconnections what their recycling program was like. And I thought that was kind of illustrating what I'm talking about. A couple more examples, and, and I want to kind of cut to the chase so we can have some time for questions. Um, this, you know, you think about innovation, and there's a lot of, you know, te technology and engineering is a big strength here at Stevens. You think about uh, innovation mostly in the context of engineering. What can we build? What can we make physically that make the world a better place? Vital stuff, you know, photovoltaics, energy storage, resilient structures, uh, zero energy buildings. There's so much to do, but this is, this is just as powerful an innovation. Who, what is this? Yeah, so a guy came up with this idea. His name is Messina, Chris Messina. In 2007, he tweeted, right in the early days of Twitter, how do you feel about using pound sign for groups, as in bar camp message? Uh, Chris was a programmer, he was at Mozilla, the early days of Firefox. And uh, bar camp, someone here must know this, it's some kind of term for programmers use. Anyway, that was the first use of a hashtag, a proposal. And within a few months, the, these blazing fires are happening in San Diego, around San Diego, and someone said, pound sign San Diego fire. And that became a way to track in real time where to evacuate from, where there are roadblocks, where, where, what was happening around San Diego. And from then forward, it just burst into usage. So it was just, you know, no one owns it. I'm sure you would like to think there was a way to. He ended up at Google. He's made up, I'm sure, a lot of money. And now he's started a new um, uh, web enterprise related to art, selling art. But he's, he's a really cool guy. I, I did an online, uh, there's a talk on YouTube that I got talking to him about this. So now, uh, it's a way to cut through all this stuff. You know, the Bieber, Bieber, Kardashian, Kardashian, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine what that would sound like if you had all those terms uh, in an auditory kind of word map? Um, but a hashtag lets you cut through that stuff. So it's like a port key in the Harry Potter books. You just, everyone latches on the port key and you all go to the same place. And that place can be, if, if you're interested in um, avoiding the next asteroid collision with Earth, um, you can follow um, the Asteroid Watch uh, account that, uh, that NASA does. It's kind of a beacon in the darkness. It's, a, it's an institution, NASA, that's really good at communication compared to many other agencies. And they this area really early on. And there are more than a million people who follow their, their feed, Asteroid Watch, to kind of keep track of what's real and not real related to that inevitable hard knock we're, we're thinking about in the long term. All of my courses now at Pace have a hashtag. Pace blog is my blogging class. University of Connecticut professor uh, Marion, uh, Marta Rubega, who's been doing this since about the time Chris uh, Messina came up with the hashtag, she requires her students, so this is a message to all the professors. Uh, in fact, they should just be able to talk to you silently. So the students cover your, your ears. This is a great uh, pedagogical tool. So if you give an assignment, she gives a standing assignment to her students every fall when she's teaching her course in bird behavior, that students, when they're out of the classroom, should be tweeting when they witness some interesting bird behavior. And they put the hashtag bird class in there, and that's a way for their observations to be, to be uh, compiled, archived, and and for her to track and grade, <laughs> because they're all timestamps. So she can kind of see who is engaged with Burns, thinking about this issue that she's teaching and who isn't. And uh, so just keep that in mind. <laughs> and maybe it'll start popping up here in Texas as well. Of course, the main value of the web, whether you're on Amazon.com or, or seeking a mate, is the Match.com aspect, where um, people with diff different needs or interests can convene, can find um, mates. And of course, it's not just dates. It's, it's um, Innocentive is a profit-making model for 
a company that has a, a widget that they're really trying to fix and they can't figure out. So they put out an open call for brilliant people to come up with an answer. Uh, Scientist, Scientists Without Borders is the New York Academy of Sciences experiment along these lines. Uh, of course, philanthropy is increasingly happening in a micro way using uh, things like Kickstarter, which is great. And think, but again, the untapped possibilities are just enormous. I, I was at a AAAS meeting three or four years ago, American Association of Advancement of Science. They had a session there called What Science Teachers Need. It was, it was one of the most valuable sessions I've gone to all the time I've been going to AAAS. And one thing that was came out was they need these little kind of little bitty videos, just sort of a one minute thing on momentum or on greenhouse gases or, or um, that kind of thing. And then they can give their lecture. The teacher can then settle in, have the students engaged and do the rest herself. So they don't need five hour, you know, David Attenborough uh, nature series. They need little bitty pieces. So, which is cool. And so here's what's really neat. In Bozeman, Montana, there's a science teacher, Paul Anderson, who has started making, anyone know about his videos? They're pretty amazing. He started this, this uh, Bozeman Science uh, YouTube channel, and he has um, 100,000 subscribers, so it's not just you know, the slow-mo guys, or Rooster Teeth, both of which I like, who are populating YouTube, and they're on all these interesting questions of science, and, and they're really, they're clear and simple, and, and they work. I'll just take you to the this site. So he's answered that call. Um, here's one on acid base equilibrium. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is Chemistry Essentials Video 68. It's on acid base equilibrium. At Harvard University, they have this wonderful Chinese statue that was donated on their 300th anniversary. And it, so we don't have to go there. <laughs> but he posted that yesterday. I hadn't seen that. Um, so we can teach each other. We can build, if you have the skills to create little videos, uh, this is what the whole MOOC phenomenon, of course, is about, that we're all, all us professors are trying to figure out. Um, and I don't know if you heard, uh, I heard him on uh, uh, Brian uh, Green from uh, World Science Festival, the, the, the mathematics and uh, physicist, has started a World Science U, which is going to debut next week, which is very similar to this. They've already got a stockpile of 500 little cookie videos. And there's no business model for it yet. <laughs> he said this, he, he was on NPR on uh, Leonard Lopez show yesterday. Just happened to catch him. So, so, but just think again of the possibility, the efficiency here, especially underfunded school systems in time of, of tight budgets. You know, if you want to have a teacher in a struggling school have a little bit of help explaining a tough concept, this is going to be a great way to do it. And uh, students can just skip that one. Students can do it too. So then there's this whole DIY aspect of the web too. Fracking is a big deal. Uh, Pennsylvania, west of here, you know, it's been perforated by a lot of wells. Uh, shale gas is a revolution that is not going away. And um, New York State, this is the New York border. You won't see anything up there because of our uh, stasis on that issue. So uh, several years ago, a young um, functionary in the Pennsylvania legislature realized there's a lot of data about these wells, that it just wasn't posted publicly. It wasn't easy for the public to find it. So he created this fracktrack.org website in a few days, and uh, it's grown a lot since then. And so now you, if you want to move to this community or you want to find out what's going on in some particular well, you click on that nubbin and you have all this geo-reference data, the, the name of who, who owns the license, uh, whether it's operating, whether there are violations. And this, this approach to there's a policing approach to gas drilling that can happen this way as well, where communities get engaged in doing their own monitoring uh, for methane, and you can start to see how this could play out in a way that gets that, that, um, that fast forwards uh, us toward uh, having that industry spread, but in a responsible way. And just a couple more examples. Scientists, some gutsy scientists are doing some fun stuff. A few years ago on Don Earth, um, Andy Bond was going to from Western Washington University was going to Siberia and uh, to do a paleo climate study and wanted me to come. And I'm like, well, I'd rather not. Those little dots are not dust on the negative. There's no negative, of course. Uh, they're bugs. They're really big biting flies. So I said, you go. <laughs> and send me back some pictures and some audio clips. And I created 
these uh, postcards that I write run on Dutter. They're not conventional journalism. You know, I'm not there in the field, but it's kind of curated content. I'm curating it, I'm judging it, and, and assembling it, and the scientist is providing it directly. Uh, Richard Alley, of course, it doesn't hurt to have tenure. So well, you can sing goofy songs about earth science if you have tenure. I wouldn't recommend it necessarily. <laughs> no. Uh, but, but, but having an adventure is, at least being willing to try is great. On, on Twitter and on Facebook and on YouTube, there, uh, Brad Diff uh, Noah Diffenbaugh is doing a YouTube Hangouts when he has a paper coming out at Stanford. Richard Betts at the Met Office, uh, Gavin Schmidt, of course, at Real Climate. Catherine Hayhoe, these people are becoming what NASA is for asteroids. They're becoming the same kind of thing for climate. They're a source of information in a, in a, in a morass, a potential morass of of useless information. So uh, I, I'm going to fast forward here because I just, just want to be sure we have time for questions. Let me give you one more example. I mean, and this is worth seeing. So um, these, uh, if you're in India, a country with a billion people scattered, still uh, about half of that population is rural. How do you uh, spread the word about good agricultural practices? They, just like here in the United States, they have extension services, but they don't have millions of agents. They have thousands. So they found a way to use, uh, when a, an, an extension agent is working with a farmer in a village, and they have some success using a new seed variety or a new planting technique, they, they shoot a little video of the farmer explaining the technique, they put it on YouTube, because everyone there, not everyone, but increasingly has access through some device to um, things like YouTube videos. That farmer can explain to other farmers the value of this process, which is so much more sticky than having some extension agent in a white coat saying, you know, if you plant the seed two weeks earlier and hold off and watering. So, so the farmer to farmer, the peer to peer um, networking of knowledge is, is a great way to amplify impact. And now the, you can see how uh, this is spreading there. And again, fast forwarding progress. The last couple of things, of course, showing instead of telling, which you know we all know is valuable. You know, I can tell you the volume of the atmosphere. It's a certain number of million cubic kilometers, or I can show you, as Adam Neiman did here a number of years ago, he created this illustration to show you that's all the air in the atmosphere if you put it in sea level pressure. That's the, it's a very finite volume, and as we head toward 9 billion people, the more we can be learning about things like the atmosphere in a way that articulates that it is actually, feels as voluminous as the oceans, and infinite, but it's not, the better off we'll be. And then there's this. This is a clever little video. You to look at them from some short distance. This can make everything unclear and confusing. So forget the details and take a step back. You're looking at a dog when you should be concentrating on the owner. As you can see, the dog is all over the place, leaping and bouncing, sometimes upwards, sometimes downwards. But where do you think it would be in 10 seconds time? Around here, right? But at this moment, the dog is on its way downward. So why do you think it will find itself up there? It's because you've noticed the owner. The owner is the trend, and it's he who determines where they both will be in a while as a bit longer than a couple of dog pounds. He could change direction. There's a lot we don't know about this guy. But everything we do know indicates he's heading in that direction. The owner is the long-term trend. The dog is the variation around this trend. Or the owner is the climate. The dog is the weather. Candy. <laughs> it's candy. <laughs> uh, company. But you know, clever, simple, conveys a point in a way that's novel and sticky, I think. It just shows you, um, and that does say something important about the role of the arts in, um, in engagement with data. The data only have meaning if, they have, if they're presented in a way that's meaningful. And, and even the New England Journal of Medicine has caught, gotten on, onto this. I don't think I have it in this particular slide presentation. Oh, hold on. But they, um, the, uh, they did an animated illustration for uh, the, the New England Journal of Medicine did this really important, um, let me just pause this for a second. Go back. Oh, I see what's going on. Go forward. Stop. Whatever, I'll just keep that playing. Um, the New England Journal of Medicine did an animated uh, uh, 
uh, illustration of, of obesity change in the community over time. The sort of patterns of obesity flowing through time is really funny. So this is like the last little illustration of the value of beauty. That beauty uh, still plays a role in um, our lives. And engaging people, reminding people through science and technology and engineering, which is what got, this is not, you probably saw Earthrise, or you know about the Earthrise photo from 1968. Japan, in 2007, replicated this, but with a high definition uh, video camera. And there's been other examples like this recent, more recently. But it shows you, uh, you know, our little blue planet in the context of the sterile moon, and it's got a lot of punch to it, I think. And we do have to realize, remember that the arts and, and, and joy is not, for too long, Arenas like religion have had sort of ownership of joy, things like that, uh, feelings. And I think we can relish um, some of these aspects of the, the way we can observe the world with the same level of joy, um, but through science as well. Hold on. The music is by uh, one of my former bandmates. So uh, that stuff matters too. And I even in a Dot Earth post recently, I um, kind of encapsulated everything. The traits that I think can get us through this century with the least regrets. And, you know, I, and I'm just going to end by saying we've, we've spent most of the last 50 years in dealing with these kinds of environmental, global environmental problems, thinking about goals. 80% reduction in CO2 by emissions by 2050. 350 parts per million by someday. Bill McKibben is a good friend of mine, but he's never articulated when and how. Um, two degrees. We can't exceed two degrees. And I, I kind of, after 30 years of writing about this kind of stuff, I'm really tired of this idea that we're going to set a goal and find the mechanisms to get society to do that when we're so wedded to energy and some of the other resource issues. And But there are things you can do. And and, and they I, I, took, I boiled them down to a couple of things. Um, Go to that post. And I know some people have to leave right around, so no worries. I write too much, you know? All right, here we go. So um, I did a series of tweets last year in May that eight, eight, nine tweets. And they basically, each one was a word with a little bit of explication. Uh, bend, stretch, reach, teach, reveal, reflect, rejoice, repeat. And one of those, each one of those is a post-it stamp for a, what should be a chapter in whatever, if I ever get around to writing another book. Bend, of course, is resilience, flexibility, adaptability. Uh, stretch is, is, the, is innovation, reaching out, you know, kind of being sure we're ready to grasp opportunities when they come along. Uh, reach is also communicate. Reach out to uh, communities around the world, make sure that ideas are spreading. Having that be part of our culture and how we teach kids, you know, to be able to think about things globally comes through reaching. Reddit, you know, my son, my 15 year old son, he'll be 16 in a week, he, uh, he lives on Reddit. I'm sure there's a, more than a couple people who live through. And, and he knows more about South Sudan than I, I ever knew about the Afro when I was a kid. And because of it's there in the flow. Teach is, of course, education, and there's so many, as I said, there's so many opportunities to advance how we teach, uh, both by network learning and by getting skill sets together to, 
to, to focus on uh, conveying knowledge in new, new, idea, new ways. Reveal is an observation, maintaining the capacity to observe systems. We're so bad at that, we're so underinvested in stream gauges, and you know, we think about NASA satellites, you know, the arguments in, in Congress about funding them. It's so short-sighted when you can only really understand change if you're measuring consistency through time. And so, so observing, revealing is also about transparency, and there's never been more transparency. You know, you can argue with some aspects of it, the Snowden <laughs> phenomenon, but it's happening, and transparency will be imposed upon you if you are not transparent in a way that's never been possible like before. Greenpeace can now monitor deforestation in, in Borneo and use YouTube videos to tell the world that our orangutans are dying because of our Kit Kat bar at appetite when the palm oil comes from, from the wrong uh, areas of Borneo. And that, that's part of the reveal process as well. And investigative journalism is, is as well. Reflect is to analyze to the, the capacity that's science. Science is observing and reflecting what's happening, what's changing, what's not changing, and then experimentation is part of that. And, and rejoice is what I just said about, you know, stopping once in a while to just say, wow, look at us. And not so much woes me. <laughs> and uh, repeat is the discipline to keep at it, to know that there's no single solution to global warming. Um, John Cronin, I co teach a course with him now in environmental policy. And, he, and I learned, myself, I learned from him about how long it takes to get a bill passed, whether it's about keeping uh, abused circus animals out of New York State, which we're working on now with my students, or whether it's about global warming. These things take time, and they're, they're not quick fixes. They're, in fact, one of the most important things, I think, to get across about global warming going forward is it's more like healthcare or poverty than it is like an old environmental problem, it, meaning it's an issue you deal with. You, you, you have healthcare is an issue you deal with, poverty is an issue you deal with. You try to whittle away at it, but it's not like something you solve. And the more we have those capacities, the more likely we are, we are to have a better outcome in this century. So that's my takeaway is just move from goals to traits, and I think we have a great prospect going forward. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. I will sing a song at the end of the questions. I have my guitar. If there aren't any questions, I'll sing. Yeah. Um, you started off talking about this, you want to get rid of this shame on you kind of uh, attitude. And I just worry if the opposite of that is just as dangerous when we think if we individually make small adjustments to our life, we can solve a lot of these problems when everybody is going to take policy issues from the top down as well. Well, yeah, you know, this. the, the question was um, top down versus bottom up. And, you know, the, none of these are, are polar questions. It's not either or, it's all, it's basically all of the above, but it's about how to, where to put emphasis. And there are some issues that have to be dealt with from the top down. Um, finding a way to discriminate between which, you know, which one has a certain color. Like, and that's what I think about greenhouse gases. They're not top down. We're not gonna have a, see any time we've tried to have a cap, and Europe is going through this right now, you end up finding ways around the cap. Uh, Europe, a lot of their manufacturing moved to Asia. So they're saying, oh, we're still reducing our emissions. It's just happening somewhere else. Um, and, and Australia did the same thing, classic thing. They passed a carbon legislation, but they're, they're exporting all their coal to China. And that's not counted in their, under their law. So that's why I have ri really little faith that for this energy, an issue that's so much about energy, that you can have a top-down approach that would matter. Some of the gases, you know, the trace gases, uh, long-lived pollutants, maybe. But it's, you're not going to have a clean, and the Clean Air Act matters here. You know, the Supreme Court gave authority to regulate CO2. And pushing on that where you can is important, but the political realities of the Clean Air Act also mean that there will always be legal challenges, and that will be kind of whittled down, and won't be, a, it won't be scientifically satisfying. People who know the math on CO2 will not be happy about that. So, so I guess it's like, it's about emphasis, not, not this is not an either or. Yeah. And then, you know. Following up on that, I mean, do you feel like the switch, you know, that people may or may not know that the U.S. CO2 emissions has dropped a bit, you know, turned down a little bit, but it's mainly through the natural gas. Right. Do you feel like, you know, one can argue that that's just an economic, but one could also argue that some part of that is the, the, the expectation that we eventually had to get off coal because CO2 and things were out 
there. They, you know, so how much do you feel like there's been a side effect of these efforts for a global treaties that's been positive? Well, the one, the one non-economic aspect of these, that problem that's pushing people toward gas, it's best illustrated in China right now. It's uh, the conventional pollution impacts from coal. Burning coal is still killing hundreds of thousands of people a year around the world. I think it's actually more, some estimates are 1.8 million or something like that. That's not why we shifted 10 years ago. What, what started it 10 years ago? The, I mean, right now, that's so true that now we're going to shift away from coal because of the health impacts. But I think 10 years ago, what, what was it that, that turned the U.S. 10 years ago to now is the reason why it wasn't, was But it wasn't 10 years ago. It was more like five. I mean, it was really gas. Yeah, sort of. You're right. I mean, it was gas. It was, it, was, it, was, it was brutally economic. It's yeah. And the gas is cheaper. And the recession also. Well, the, the, the recession that. reduced overall emissions for sure. But, but no, they've already done, there have been analyses that try, try to parse that out. And, and gas and efficiency gains, efficiency gains are happening also. And that's part of an organic process. Water efficiency in industry, uh, energy efficiency in the industry as companies' bottom lines get tighter and tighter. That really matter. Um, there's so much more there, of course, that can be done, and it's. And this is where rules, standards, like for appliances, absolutely. There's there's way or for, like you, you, the contrast when you go to a hotel in any other country and you go to a hotel here and the hallway lights staying on. Um, you know, most hotels overseas now you you have to put your key into a slot for the room lights to go on, and you have to take your key out when you leave and the room lights go out. You know, I would like to see that be the norm here, it's not here yet. Um, that would be a tougher one. That can't be mandated to you the way we work in this country. But you can have pressure from from visitors to hotels to, hey, I don't, I don't want to stay at a hotel that doesn't have these kinds of amenities. I don't know. So it's, I'm getting, I'm straying a little bit from your point, but well, I do, it's you mostly econ econ economic. Yeah, you would conclude that global climate um, efforts have not played a big role, or, or no. environmental anti-climate efforts haven't played a big role in the U.S. turning down their, you know, turning the corner recently on CO2. Yeah, well, again, when you look at Europe, most analyses of Europe's emissions trends in recent years say, say whatever gains have happened there. I mean, Germany obviously has done a lot of renewables, but if, but if you look at the overall stuff, including leakage from manufacturing moving, and it's not really, again, the U.S. has done better than Europe with its big top-down top approach. So um, the economy is really the thing. And now Europe's kind of backing away from some of those mandates. Uh, yeah. There's so much communication out there, the internet and Twitter and, and, and all that. How do you sort out what's right and what's not right? I give a homework assignment, yeah. and then what's your opinion? And I get the <laughs> stuff that's not true. <laughs> they go on the internet and, and parrot what they find. Well, there are some good, but it depends on what you're looking at. Um, as I said, realclimate.org, you know, there's there are there are beacons of knowledge out there, and if, so what you have to do is we have to develop a culture. See, students in the old days, I, here's a shorthand thing. In the old days, a skill you needed as a student was memorization, multiplication tables. You don't need that anymore. You don't need that anymore. You don't need to memorize anything really anymore. It's all there. Just like soon, you'll literally be able to just flex your eyebrow and know and answer a question. But you do need to you know, know how to navigate information more than ever because in the old days Walter Cronkite told us all what was going on and now we have to learn it ourselves. So, so people have to be more active learners and more active discriminators of stuff. And there's tools out there. Snopes.com is a website for, this is more for like the image of the giant squid that washed up on the beach in California the, the size of a 18-wheeler. <laughs> you know, there's ways to immediately know or the grandmother who stopped the Mercedes. I'm sure some of you have seen this. That was trying to. That was an advertisement in Scandinavia. It was not. It didn't really happen. But you can find that stuff out instantly if you know where to go and look for. Uh, so, so we have to learn different traits, different skills. It's harder. It's going to be harder. And as I as I say, like in the old days, we had it so easy because you just opened the New York Times and listened to Walter Cronkite. And you didn't have to think. They did. They did it for you. Now you have to do it more. Following up on that. You know, when you transmit your message, it goes into a channel that has certain characteristics, and you know, the Russian oil thing was kind of a good example of the extreme, but this week's, uh, one of the things the channel does is it 
in any kind of nuanced communication, breaks it in half and separately transmits the two halves. So this week's example is the minimum wage is going to cost $500,000, but raise the level, economic level of millions of people. Right? Last week's example was the uh, the fact that Obamacare is going to have two, mil two million people who are no longer going to work. They don't have to work for health care. Yeah. Knowing the characteristics of the channel, are there ways to shape your message to make it less susceptible to that kind of distortion? Well, that presumes that the person putting out the message wants reality to be the result. Well, you do. Yeah, but, but like the Obama administration or, you, you know, a politician usually wants to twerk it one way or another. I know, um, but I'm thinking of the good guys in the world like you. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'd like to think of Obama as a good guy, too. Yeah. But even like, like John Kerry's speech he gave in Indonesia that I, I kind of criticized on Dot Earth yesterday um, was really distorted and had some real problematic aspects of it, both his diplomacy and, and some of the science. And, you know, the administration is their goal is to get something done or to have a certain message. Um, for people like me, all I can do is what I do, which is to, I run Dot Earth as kind of an open, an open place. And um, I'll sometimes feature some commentary from someone I disagree with, and then I'll we'll have discussions. I do think, like, if I were teaching a course in um, sustainable development, which I don't really right now teach communication courses, I would have the students read books in pairs. They should read, um, um, well, Bill any, any one of Bill McKinnon's books, and then I should read The Rational Optimist by Rat Matt Ridley, which is a really interesting historical account of human progress, mostly coming from commerce and trade, and how the more we trade, the more we have commerce, the more, the more advanced we become, the more successful we become. And it's a very optimistic view of where we're headed. And Bill is very dire, and but read them together and engage and think about it. I'll give you a quick example from Dot Earth of um, after Fukushima happened, two powerful uh, environmental writers, McKibben and George Monbiot, who's like the um, McKibben equivalent in, in the UK, did a, uh, they both did essays for, uh, oh gosh, I do write too much. <laughs> they, they both wrote essays for, um, the Guardian, oh, here we go, giving their reactions to what had just happened with, this, with the nuclear power plants. And so these are two guys who, their, their prime task is solving the global warming problem. And one said, Fukushima shows you that uh, nuclear power is robust, that it survived, that the, here this epic hit from a tsunami did not unleash a huge deadly cloud of radiation. No one, that we know of has yet died from radiation poisoning, even the direct affected uh, workers. Um, from that incident, uh, it has huge ramifications, many of which are troubling. But it shows that you know, we can go forward with better nuclear power plants, we can do this. And Bill McKinnon, of course, said, no, this shows you how brittle this technology is. We need to have less energy, a smaller, local. And so having those two arguments side by side is much more revealing than another approach. And that's, so that's what I try to do. It's, it's not, it doesn't make me a popular columnist because most of us go to a columnist to reinforce our predispositions, as, as I said earlier. So it's kind of like, how do you make that the mainstream? How do you make that how we learn? I, I don't know. All I can do is write it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. But in an age where it was not memorized, we should not memorize how many things to memorize. You seem to memorize a whole lot of websites and uh, outfits and things like that. But anyway, this is just a uh, ingest. Yeah. Uh, I have a very hard time reconciling the first part of the talk with the second part, especially the conclusion of the second part that uh, got us to brief that uh, you know uh, global warming is like healthcare and psychology. I fundamentally disagree with that. There has been huge progress in improving healthcare world, uh, worldwide, maybe not in the US because of Obamacare, yeah. but certainly a huge progress in alleviating poverty worldwide. Uh, the problem with global warming is here to stay, it's here to get worse. Uh, coal production is not going to uh, abate, it's going to go up. Yeah. Uh, energy consumption is supposed to, dry, uh, to, to go by over 65% in the next 10 to 20 years. 
But, but to uh, me, it's so, you know, the, the Hans and others have shown that uh, we are nearly at the point of irreversibility. And Elizabeth Colbert, in the latest book, also shows us, she doesn't seem to be particularly optimistic about uh, extensions yeah. on the one hand, acidification, and so forth. So, uh, but please, but please but make me an optimist uh, without having to surf the web to get uh, redemptory messages. Yeah, well, but, but again, I, recognizing those realities, I think, reinforces my argument. Because there isn't some grand police that's going to come down and say, this is this serious, therefore you need to turn off all the lights in China right now, and which is not going to happen. So when you realize those things are not going to happen, the only approach, and I'm not saying this is like a happy, happy, you know, bend, stretch, reach, teach, whatever it sounds like, you know, a lot of that, but it's, it's not. It, it, you, can, you can ramp that up as well. But, but, but that's the only way forward, I think, that, that can actually encompass a problem as grand as our energy climate. Uh, so maybe the, the, the new generations will be... Uh, the, as as impacts or become or clear, or as long-term... Yeah. You know, Stuart Brand, uh, the, the great Stuart Brand, he wrote a book called The Whole Earth Discipline, which is, I like just for the title, the title alone is so great, because it gets at what I was saying about the new discipline to repeat and be rigorous about these things. Um, he, had, he created a foundation called the Long Now Foundation. He's trying to stretch how we think about time, how we think about you know, risks, because global warming, with all you've heard about real-time impacts, is still mainly uh, back-loaded. The, the worst impacts are still far in, in the future, meaning another generation or two, unless there is some un unanticipated uh, job that we don't know about. There's a paper coming Thursday in, in science that I'm going to send to him that might indicate some other wild cards in the ocean. But, but again, I, so I think in a way, to me, you're reinforcing and reinforcing my argument. Because it, you know, if, if it was true that some, like if Al Gore suddenly became a superhero and kind of you know, could, could sort of mandate a global decarbonization. Maybe but one I, more question. Yeah. when to put their livestock down because they just can't survive anymore. They're not planting. Yeah. Um, so that's in the West. And then that against the huge amount of water that's needed for fracking and it isn't going to be So you can say there's such a huge dichotomy and yeah. I hear a lot of people addressing that dichotomy. Well, um, water, you know, water is the main interface between us and the climate system. It's really the thing that matters. Heat can kill people. And, and it, heat waves are the clearest signal of global warming. Water is tougher. In fact, knowing where it's going to get water, the piece in the Times by Justin Gillis a couple of days ago on, on the climate science was correct in noting that the computer models say overall the West should be getting wetter in coming decades. So, you, and of course, paleoclimatology says the West that the 20th century, when we basically built the modern West, was 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 uh, abnormally, apparently wet. So all the norms of the West, where we built, what we built how many golf courses there are there, that we grow stuff in certain places there. You've seen uh, uh, anything with rainwater, or, or, or actually irrigation through the Colorado, is, was all during a period that was apparently wet. So now, whether or not global warming is in play, what's, what's being seen out there now is essentially warming. And uh, so that's really important. On the, on the water use for energy, um, fracking is, um, on its own, uses a lot of water. But a, what I, I just uh, there was a guy named Rob Jackson who just moved to Stanford from Duke. He's done a lot of work on water contamination fracking. He pointed me to work that shows you when you use a macro um, a macro look at energy use that fracking that, that uh, gas fired power plants use so much less water uh, for cooling that the fracking water is like a is like a it's not a rounding error but it's a small thing compared to the water use. In, and heated in, in water use in power plants that use water cooling like coal. So again, moving away from coal to gas is a very wise thing if you worry about water when you look with that scale. And there are ways to do water-free fracking. There, there's just some early experiments in um, Quebec province. Um, there's a company that's now, they've been trying to get into the United States where they use um, propane as the propent to, to get the propane down into the liquid, you know, liquefied. 
propane get into the pores and get, get the fracking. Also. Of course, that comes with other issues like safety, worker safety. So, so and again, that gets to the reality. These are all kind of trade-offs. And, uh, but, anyway. So, so yeah, if you don't mind, I, I'll end. Uh, I am a multimedia. <laughs> Multimedia communicator. And guitar is one of my media. It took a thousand generations for our species to rise. The gathering and hunting was no way to get by. We yearned to burn more than dung and sticks. Along and said, Hey, try lighting this. We opened up the ground and showed us coal and oil. Said, Come liberate some carbon, it'll make your blood boil. Liberated carbon, it'll spin your wheels. Liberated carbon, it'll do your meals. Liberated carbon, it'll turn your night to day. Hey, hey, come on and liberate some carbon, baby. Now I got heat swamp fossils running my TV. BP's black label burns in my Humvee. We can light up the planet like a Christmas tree. Yeah, they say that things are getting hot, but hey, we've got AC. Adaptation. Liberated carbon, it'll spin your wheels. Liberated carbon, it'll spin your wheels. Liberated carbon, it'll turn your night to day. Hey, hey, come on and liberate some carbon, babe. It's the American way. Puff those electrons and that gasoline. Sweater, hurry, just turn on the machine. Send an army to the desert. 